Hi, and welcome to week one, part one of Intro to Computer Science. So this is the first video of the entire course. We are going to be talking a little bit about what computer science actually is and why it's important. We're also going to delve into a little bit about the history and how of computer science, of computers, and how they came to be, really. Now, this might seem like it's not really necessary to know to start coding, and I can understand why you would feel that way, but there is a reason why we're talking about this. So, learning about how the computer came to be and how it sprang into existence is a really good way to understand how computers work on the most fundamental basic principle. It's its core essence how it actually operates. And sometimes it can be a bit difficult to explain and to understand how computers think. But if you know about the origin, it's so much more tangible uh, how it works and it's easier to understand because it's more relatable, relatable and understandable. So that's why we're talking about it a little bit. We're also going to delve into a little bit about the um, history of the computer and from its conception to today, how it's, how it's evolved. And again, this might seem like uh, something you would do at an introduction that doesn't really have to do with what you're gonna practically be doing. But there is a reason for this as well. Um, and the reason is that when computers started to where they are today, they've evolved very much to fit uh, the everyday man, the everyday user. So they've grown to be more and more intuitive, simple to use and uh, to understand. But at certain points in the uh, evolution of the computer, so to speak, um, certain software might have originated in the same place, but kind of gone off and developed differently. And these might be tools that you will use in the future. So for example, you might be using um, databases. So if they started out here and here's the evolution of the computer, maybe you know and use, uh, databases kind of went off in a different direction. And if you know the timeline up until then, when you work with databases, you will see terms and the way things are structured that um, you might understand better if you know how it evolved uh, throughout time. So there is a reason for this and when you come across it at least you've heard the term once or you've heard the basic principle or you kind of know um, where that came from and you kind of understand the context a bit more and that will help you to uh, solve problems and understand how these uh, other tools that laymen don't encounter how they work. So that's the reason why we're going through that a little bit. We're also going to be talking a little bit about ethics and um, both the responsibility of um, us, well mostly about the responsibility uh, of us as de developers. Um, what do we have to think about and why do we even need to think about ethics and why is ethics important when you go into the field? We're also going to be talking about the um, impact technology has had on a society. Uh, and again, this is so that you can understand not only where it came from, but also what might be possible to do with it. So you might think that a computer is just a piece, piece of technology that we're so used to, but by knowing how certain even applications or certain hardware like the iPhone change society, you can sort of see the, the possibilities of applications for the future. A uh, hundred years from now, we never thought we would need a, com uh, a phone that is like a computer, a smartphone. Um, but we have them today and they're essential to everyday life. So by seeing how it's evolved and how it's impacted us, we can sort of try to start to think about how future technology might be invented, maybe, by us, um, and how that might impact uh, society then. It's really about what problems aren't we aware of that we can actually solve using technology. And we're going to talk a little bit about the future of technology and AI and 
the dangers of AI, but also the possibilities and how you can use them practically uh, yourself. And a little bit about how they work. It's uh, good to know how they, how they function when you use them so that you use them for the right things. So that is a little bit about what we're going to go through today. And uh, let's just jump in. So let's start with what really is computer science? Um, well, it's broadly speaking, everything that has to do with computers. It's the hardware, the things you can touch, toss, feel, uh, and it's the software that runs on the hardware. So what does that mean, software that runs on the hardware? Well, when you break it down to the most fundamental level, software is instructions written in code. Um, you use code to talk to the computer and tell it what to do, um, and the computer interprets that code, those instructions, and then does what you've told it to do, really. These instructions might look different depending on what you're using them for. Coding a website, encoding a game, encoding a server, or coding um, application to use, be used by hospitals, or even coding something like a pacemaker might look very different, and they will all use different um, tools with software, different languages, different syntax. So what does that mean? That means that all computer languages, all programming languages have their own way of speaking. I like to think of it as just how we as humans can express the same idea in different languages, uh, code expresses the same instructions in different programming languages. So if we continue that metaphor, um, we all, all over the world, when we speak different languages, have different ways of arranging words and we have different spellings and pronunciations. But we all have verbs, or at least most of us, a lot of them. Uh, we all use um, nouns, we all have um, decided that we're going to put words in a certain order. And this order might be different for different languages, but how we speak is very similar all over, really. And you can think of code and programming language languages in the same way. They might use different terms, but they express the same instruction. So, as you can imagine, computer science and the applications of it is extremely broad. And once you understand the fundamental how code works, you can do so many things. And a lot of the time, the skills you learn are transferable from one area to another. If you have been working with games, you might not instinctively know how to make a website, but you can sort of jump in and learn along the way and you'll still recognize the same way of speaking to a computer. You just might use different tools depending on what you're trying to accomplish. So thinking about all the different jobs that you can have, let's just go through some basic, just a little few so you can understand the whole scope of what you could do. So you could be a game programmer so you would work in something called a game engine most of the time, which is a tool that helps you connect things that artists and musicians uh, create with your code. So when you, uh, say, have a 3D model and you put it into the game engine, so you have a human character that you're going to play, until uh, the programmer has applied animations on top of that 3D model, or until a programmer has made sure that leaves on a tree, on a 3D model in the game, moves in the wind, everything is completely static. Nothing moves, nothing does anything. You might have a button on a, on a wall that opens a door, and until the programmer comes in and makes sure that when you press that button, something happens, it's just like statues, stone, nothing does anything. So the programmer's job then is to uh, add interaction and add co um, consequences when you interact with the world and make it possible to even interact with the world. Um, gaming just kind of looked like Sims, so 
you have the world, you add models into the world, and then you go into a, um, uh, a program where you code, then you get a little file, a script, and then you just drag and drop that on top of uh, 3D models or what, what have you, UI and menus and things like that. So that is how that work looks like. Um, you could be a software developer and that is probably what most people think of when they think of a programmer or a coder and you create, you write so and design software. And of course, this again, incredibly broad. You could be doing a website servers, you could be working with databases, you could do mobile applications, but in broad general terms, a software developer is um, software that is like not a game, it's not specific for that function, it's any type of software that one might use like um, an app on your phone or um, a program that you can download and that maybe cleans up your computer. That would be a software developer who's done that. Uh, you could work in inter interdisciplinary fields. <laughs> um, and this is super cool. These are people who do work with code, but for a specific field such as uh, neurology, where they maybe work with brains and the um, electrical signals of the brain and develop applications that people who research this uh, might use. Or you might work with biology and create a program that um, catalogs, this has probably already been done, but, but catalogs uh, DNA sequences. Um, you could be wo working with uh, robotics and you could be doing software that maybe uh, stores uh, um, behaviors that a robot might uh, exhibit or, or, or do. Um, so these are applications, tools, programs to visualize and help these other disciplines that might need it for research, for storage. Um, yes. You have data scientists and these people take a lot of data and uh, make sure that it's understandable for people. So they'll take a huge amount of data and they will make sure that each piece of data has been uh, labeled correctly and they interpret that data. They, uh, for example, count how many, let's see, how many uh, men versus women go into the military or apply for the military. And then when people want to have um, make decisions about this, they might visualize that data for people who uh, don't do the statistical side so that they can have a basis for making decisions. Um, or it could be a store that wants to understand why we sell um, a certain product at a certain time, why that sells more. So you gather data, you try to interpret it, understand it, and your job is to visualize it to the people who maybe want to sell more of that product and understand what can we do to sell more of that product? Why are people buying uh, this more during this specific period of time? Um, you could work in uh, security, cyber security, and your job is to protect people and enterprises, um, companies from uh, people getting hold of uh, information or uh, using information, corrupting information, stealing information. Um, and you can do that by uh, working with software and for example, examine what uh, people do at the company to make sure that nothing strange is going on, that nobody's accessing files that they aren't, they, they shouldn't, that they don't have permission to. And it could even be something like pretending to be a, uh, um, a computer repairman and go into a bank and ask to see, uh, uh, see, look at their computers and see if they grant you access to their computers without asking for any qualifications. So that's a bit about different types of jobs that you could be doing. Um, but I haven't even exhausted a teeny tiny bit of what you, you might be able to do with, uh, in, within programming and, and computer science, really. <clears throat> but let's move on to the origins of the computer. 
So this is that part where um, it's going to hopefully what I'm wanting, what I want you to gain from this is to understand how computers, how the basic core philosophy of computers uh, came to be. So the origin of the computer is a loom. And a loom is a um, machine that weaves fabric together. So it does that by having two needles or more, but needles and thread and weave them over and under and over and under. It's a very repetitive mechanical work. People used to manually move these needles and then press down the fabric and continue doing that like this. Um, it was repetitive, it was um, tedious, it took time, and there wasn't a lot of variation in the work. There wasn't a lot of thinking you had to do to, uh, to weave fabric. And people could even, um, by not going every other weave, so if you have two threads like this, by not going like this every other, by skipping them like this, they could create uh, patterns in that fabric. Um, and they did beautiful fabrics, beautiful, intricate um, uh, pieces for clothing. Um, but again, it was time consuming and it was very expensive to buy. So somebody invented the jacquard loom. So they figured, well, what if we just put a piece of paper, really, in front of the needle and if we didn't want the needle to go through there would be no hole for it to penetrate and if we did want it to go through we would create a hole so that the needle could go and by doing that you could automate the process of weaving weaving fabric but then taking it one step further what if you could switch out the cards what if you could have a machine where you could put the cards in and the machine would do what that specific set of cards would uh, would ask that it to do and then when you were done you could take out the cards and have a different pattern and really this is the basis of both the principle of uh, binary thinking and the basis of uh, programmability so what is this binary principle or this sort of binary way of thinking that computer have. Well, if you think about the loom, there was no way to do half a weave or, or uh, a little bit of between uh, the threads. There is between or not. There is um, uh, a punch card with a hole or there isn't a hole. It's very absolute, black and white. And if you can mentally connect that to the ones and zeros, that computer code essentially boils down to. Uh, even in the hardware, computers uh, execute their instructions by turning teeny tiny gateways of electricity on and off. So a one in your code, not that you will uh, write one, one, zero, one, one, but everything you write will be converted into that format because it will trickle down and eventually it will tell the hardware, please turn this specific switch off and please turn this on. And that is um, how the computer uh, performs its instructions. So computers are very absolute black and white and they're extremely literal. So if you would think about the simplest thing like um, explaining how to make a sandwich, um, you might say, well, use a knife and spread the butter. But a computer might not know which end of the knife to use to spread the butter. It might also not think about opening the package of the butter, the top, and just stab it through the side because you haven't specified. So you need to be literal, you need to be exact, black and white, and you need to think about the fact that the computer knows nothing. And that is a sort of way to get into how computers think. And the binary principle is how do I convert my idea into that form of speech? So if you want to take another example that we'll use later on in the course, um, 
going across the street at a traffic light. Um, you might say, if the light is green, pass, uh, go across the street. And that is the simplest, simplest form that you instruct a computer what to do, really. Um, if green, uh, if light is green, walk. If not, stop. Um, as you continue on, you will have to think about, well, what if there's a car even though the light is green? But for now, just know that the binary principle is about absolutes in your speech and finding a way to convert your maybe ambiguous or, or gray zone idea into that sort of, into that expression. So that is the binary principle, this, this idea of black and white thinking that computers have. So how did the computer come from a loom that seems like a bit of a stretch, right? So there was a mathematician called uh, Charles Babbage and he was intrigued by the loom and he thought that if, if they could do that for making fabric, what if you could create a machine that could do any math problem you wanted it to do? Um, they used to have these abacuses, they were like these with the, with the with, um, wooden uh, balls that you would move across. That would be a mechanical way of doing it, but what if you could just feed a machine punched cards and it could do any math problem you would want it to do? Um, and he called it the um, analytical machine, or one second. Even more pretentious, analytical engine. Uh, and he worked on that for a while and there was this lady called uh, Ada Lovelace that was intrigued by this. So Ada Lovelace contacted Charles Babbage or she got into contact with him with a mutual fr uh, through a mutual friend and expressed fascination with fly uh, with uh, this analytical machine and how it worked really and from that really sprang this um, this whole idea that went way way beyond just doing math calculations now ada was a bit of a of a funny character uh, if you've ever um, taken uh, literature um, she was the daughter of lord byron who was a big figure in the romantic era um, the same era as uh, Frankenstein and Dracula and all the romantic and, and horror um, writers, really. And he was a huge, huge figure in that movement. Um, so Ada had that with her in her, in her in her history, the connection to art. Um, but she was incredibly interested in science, in math, physics, how things worked. Um, and when she uh, learned about the analy analytical engine and started looking at it, she became fascinated by it. So she was tasked by a Italian mathematician uh, to translate his article on the analytical engine. Um, and she did that. And when she handed in uh, the translated article, she appended uh, notes. And it's really in these notes that the, the idea behind how computers could be applied um, came into existence because she thought what if these um, punched cards didn't represent numbers what if they represented symbols that could be exchanged what if they were um, what if they weren't so literal what if it wasn't a number but what if um, they managed to express um, the relationship between two things, being very general and vague here. But for example, what if one card could represent true? And what if one card could, rep could represent false? So then we're moving away from just math numbers to really um, translating these things into something else. So what if a set of whole and not whole, whole and not whole could be green, the color green, and another set of instructions put together could be the color blue. Well then if you put them all together you could actually create an image with these, um, 
with these instructions? Or what if um, whole not whole whole was a certain musical note? And what if you put them these all different musical notes together? Well, then you could create music, really. And then as soon as you can go away from math and these these holes and these sets of instructions could represent anything you wanted, you could use them to create anything you wanted, really. Um, and it was Babbage who um, made sure that the machine worked, that, well, he never finished it, but it was his idea about how to apply the loom to something else. Um, and Ada didn't really uh, do anything practical to the machine beyond that. But just this idea of having these instructions represent anything you want it to represent is sort of what sparked um, the computer as a piece of machinery, as a tool for us to use today. Now there's lots of debate about who wrote the first algorithm and and who who was the actual originator and without going into um, a debate about who did that uh, the idea of representing representing um, things with these these sets of holes or not holes um, that kind of um, cemented her as the first programmer um, she might not have uh, finished the ma uh, machine or um, contributed to the field much more than some algorithms that she wrote herself but the idea that it could represent something that really is the true revolutionary and practical application that kind of sprang from that so Ada Lovelace the first programmer so now that we know how the computer came to be let's talk about how it kind of evolved from that we'll do a big jump in time that isn't truly interesting and not really applicable to you, but we'll go to the 1940s. So if you ever heard the term mainframe um, and had no idea what that is, basically it's a huge ass computer in a room. If you've ever seen a movie where there's this big lump of a machine, that is a mainframe. So these mainframes were extremely sensitive, uh, powerful, and they were used only really by um, universities or the military or government agencies and eventually the big corporations could afford uh, to get one and to train their uh, staff into using one. But just to give an example of, of um, what it was like to be in a room with a mainframe, uh, my mom studied uh, in Warsaw during the, gosh I think it was 60s, 70s, 70s had to be. Um, and she got to uh, work a little bit with a mainframe computer just to try it out. Uh, she's an engineer. And she told me how uh, you couldn't wear normal shoes in the same room because the rubber from the shoes could um, change. Uh, the, uh, you could get an electrical um, build, uh, build up and you could create a static shock that would uh, destroy the, the hardware. And you had to put on these um, the same sort of covers on your feet that you have in hospitals um, and you had to go uh, sh they had to go into a room and make sure that nothing had any static electricity so that they wouldn't damage the hardware and then they could go into the room where the computer was being housed um, so that is early mainframes and uh, how how sensitive and big they were because it was it was just the room consisted of, consisted of the computer that was that was the entire room just the one computer and they had these um, much like the loom really where you had holes for weaving they had these long um, papers of um, uh, with punched holes in it that gave instructions to the computer that fed the computer instructions so eventually um, a new type of um, mainframe or a new type of um, piece of technology was developed. Um, so with mainframes, all of the hardware was specialized and very separate from each other. They needed to talk to each other, but each piece of hardware had its own job. And I think during the 1970s, um, the microchip was invented. 
So it took all of these separate entities contained in, an, in a mainframe and put it on one single chip. Now, if you ever really think about what is a microchip, well, actually it's a very small and not that powerful, but that is a computer. Um, so taking all of these separate entities and putting it onto one baseline microchip, it made it faster. It made the different components talk to each other faster. It made it more durable. It was smaller and it was a lot less expensive to make. Um, and if beforehand the military, the government, big corporations could afford to own these mainframes and train and, and work with them, when it got smaller and when it became cheaper, um, it opened up for uh, smaller companies, smaller uh, actors um, to use this technology as well. It sort of decentralized it and made it available to, to a lot more people. Um, and this really gave um, laymen or, or gave people who weren't part of, for example, NASA, the opportunity to, to test it, to try it out, to see what it can do, to try to use it for different applications. Um, and from that, it kind of exponentially exploded that if it was so available, a lot of more people could try it out and use it and see what it could do. And it just developed from there and took off at a very, 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 um, took, just, it just took off very, very fast um, how the rest of the of computers uh, evolved because of that. So then in the late 70s and 80s, um, even more, um, both technological and uh, technological breakthroughs and uh, application, different applications, um, made it so much more available to a lot more people. Not only did they invent the microchip, it was an even smaller uh, computer. They also started developing um, something called a user interface. So with mainframes and older computers, you don't really have any graphical representation of anything. You have text. That's the only way to see what the computer has on it, say your file. Um, and you can only communicate with it via text typing in a command, pressing enter, and then the computer processes that command. And this is not very intuitive and it's not very easy to understand. And it takes a long time for somebody to get into that. So you had these special employees that knew how to do it and nobody else could do it. Um, of course, specialized training, both expensive and when you have few people who know how to do it, it just sort of stalls the development with the uh, development of user interfaces they helped visualize this so that you didn't need to know the same things that uh, you did when you had text on a screen um, you saw something that looked like a folder and you could mentally connect that to being a, st a container for something um, you could drag a mouse and double click and you could see the mouse move across the screen. Whereas before you would have to, and this is not real code, it's just pseudo code, meaning I'm telling you what I would want the code to do, but it's not real coding language, but um, uh, open folder, enter. Um, and if you didn't know that command, you wouldn't be able to open that folder. But with the user interface, most people eventually would try to move the mouse if they were presented with a mouse and they would try to click once or cl right click or, or double click. They would experiment and they would faster, more intuitively find a way to work with this technology. So with this came the personal computer. Finally, 40 years after mainframes, computers that were available to civilians to people who didn't work in enterprises or companies and that could have them at home um, now you really didn't need any training you just needed to have some money and be able to buy this piece of technology and plug it in and you could experiment all you wanted and you can imagine what a big um, impact that had making computers available for everyone and making them easy to use and so easy to use that anyone could anyone could really sit down and try to experiment with them. 
So this was the personal computer revolution and it was Apple and IBM that um, really started that. And so we had one revolution followed by another revolution, um, which arguably has changed our world forever. And that is the internet. So the internet was uh, invented in the early 90s. And at first it was used uh, for research and it was used internally at CERN, I believe. And then the inventor was convinced to release this to the public. Um, so you had these um, ways of, at a workplace at CERN in this case, connecting computers together so that if I had something I wanted to share with somebody else that worked there, um, they were connected and it was easy to transfer information. But with the internet, you could transfer that information from one end of the world to the other. And this, of course, changed everything. So what actually is the internet? The internet is the world's largest network. So if I sit and look in my home and how many computers I have, you might say that I have my network, my local area network here, and I can share resources uh, through one computer that I own with another computer that I, that I own. And the internet is taking all of these networks all across the world and linking them to each other. A big mega network, if you will, really. So this network allows us access to the World Wide Web, WWW. Um, they're not the same thing. Uh, the internet allows you access to the World Wide Web, uh, whereas the World Wide Web itself is something different. Um, the World Wide Web is accessed via a browser, which is a software that enables you to um, ask for and receive resources. So when you type in a, U a URL, an address uh, on the world uh, on th in your browser, what you're really doing is you're um, moving through the network to that computer and you're asking, hey, can I, can I get this resource from you? And your, the, that computer that, uh, that you've asked responds to you and says, yes, sure, here you go. And um, gives you the code to uh, open, for example, Facebook. So your browser receives that code and processes it. And then it displays the page that you wanted. And the internet is, uh, the World Wide Web, sorry, it's, it's very easy to, to use them interchangeably, but I'm trying to explain the difference so, so that it's there somewhere uh, from the beginning. Um, it's structured through something called hyperlinks. Um, so hyperlinks is um, a way of moving across the internet. Um, I'm sure you, you've uh, used hyperlinks and you've experienced sort of how it could work. So you go into, say, one Wikipedia page because you want to look something up and then you see uh, something underlined in blue and you know that that's a link. And then you click on that link and you go to the next page. That is a hyperlink. So all of these pages together are they're connected through these links where you go from one link to the other link to the other link to the other link and they're all connected. Um, I, I heard a lecture once where they uh, compared the internet to uh, how mushrooms uh, work. You don't have a start or a finish to the to the World Wide Web. You don't have the first page. You don't really have the an entryway or an exit and everything is connected to each other. So it's really this strange structure that, that you can just travel via hyperlinks through the information that you have. Whereas if you have a file cabinet, you usually just go, they're separate, you go one, two, three, four, five. Here you can sort of access them really through anywhere and start anywhere and end up anywhere because they're connected through via uh, hyperlinks. So once the internet and the World Wide Web was, was uh, available, of course, people started selling things there and they started putting up pages. 
and uh, they managed to find a way to uh, put up anything that they wanted. It was this hodgepodge of um, people who had an interest in putting something up on the internet and you could just uh, um, type in the URL. If you mistyped, well, too bad. Nobody was there to tell you that you did something wrong. It just wouldn't load. And even when it did load, you could go and make a sandwich to wait for one image to um, to process and to look at it, uh, really. Um, but with this came, of course, e-commerce and lots of changes. And as soon as it's profitable, which it is if you sell things on the internet, people want to invest in it and make it better, easier and more accessible to other people to sell more products. So from this sprang internet service providers that um, wanted to uh, allow people uh, more access, easier access to the internet. So they um, built different ways of uh, connecting uh, the network, the internet together. They, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of uh, fiber and, and laying uh, cables so that we can communicate with each other. And internet service providers um, exploded and, and offered ways to connect to the internet um, to everyday people. And so we got more and more uh, connected and more and more, more online. And then in 1995, another big revolution in personal computers came about. Windows released Windows 1995. Not a very uh, original name, but a very uh, original and um, influential concept and uh, piece of operate, uh, operating system. So they introduced the start menu where you could see all the things you, can, you have on your computer and all the things you could do and they introduced a lot of the uh, icons and the way things look visually and the way we structure um, the UI, the user interface that we kind of still draw from today. Um, and this was a huge leap in how accessible computers were to everyday people. Um, with this, it was really about buying it, sitting down and you could just almost plug and play intuitively understood what it looks like. It's really hard to overstate the impact this had to spread the personal computers um, to everyday households. Um, and this sort of computer, the way it looked, the icons, the, the, the vibes, it, it became uh, adopted into other media, into print, it was in commercials, and it sort of worked its way into everyday life. It became a part of everyday life, really. And today, um, people have a job professionally to just design uh, intuitive um, and beautiful and um, easy to use uh, user interface, user interfaces. And these are called UX designers. Um, some people even say that um, the design and the art, uh, the design of UI and making it beautiful, is, it's a new art form. Um, so all of that really started in, a, in the biggest way for most people with Windows uh, 95. So as more and more people become, uh, started being online, uh, broadband uh, came along and modems got faster and we replaced uh, cables with Wi-Fi and we just became more and more online and became easier and faster to get online to access the internet and to browse the World Wide Web. Now if you've uh, been, if you were online during the 90s, you um, might remember how cumbersome and unintuitive the web was. Uh, it wasn't unusual for websites to be spread by word of mouth, like, have you heard of that weird website? And there was no real way of finding websites. You, if, if you knew, you knew. Um, but then another revolution came along, lots of revolutions here. In 1998, Google was invented. So if, uh, if you were born after 1998, you've never experienced a world without Google. Um, but Google 
made it easy to search for things online. It wasn't easy before. And not only was it easy to search, it made, uh, it had, uh, they have written code that could understand and could make the, um, the suggestions they presented more applicable and more personal to what you wanted to look at. And they would present it in a way that would be easy to navigate and, and easy to find. Um, and this really, while it didn't um, change the internet itself, it gave a much easier, much simpler, faster access and you could actually search for what you wanted and, and see what was out there in a much easier way than ever before. Um, there was never, no, never any type of central storage of links that if you were interested in cats, here are these links. Um, you had to know it or you had to go to a, um, a shelter that would have the URL so you could type it out from the piece of paper. But with Google, you could search, you could enter a search term and it would give you all the relevant uh, pages that you could go through to investigate. So again, um, not the revolution of, of having the information, but the uh, revolution in how to access and find um, that information. So eventually when Google got a lot more money, they could buy YouTube. That's right, they didn't invent YouTube, they bought it. Could be wrong, but uh, I think that's that's the case. Um, anyhow, this isn't such a revolution in terms of the technology or or how to interact with with computers per se, but the revolution here, and it is a revolution, is that um, for a lot of history, the people who owned, for example, a printing press or a TV network were the ones who decided what would be broadcast to the general public. That's why it was such an uh, such a important tool for, for um, political figures that maybe weren't the nicest, because they could control what people saw. And with YouTube, that control was taken away from, from uh, TV networks, from uh, radio, from magazines, from newspapers, you name it. Because all of a sudden, anyone could broadcast anything to everyone. Um, and that gatekeeping mechanism, the people who had the means to broadcast, that was taken away from them. Um, so not only can we get out any idea and, and you can just broadcast anything you want, um, you can also, because people want to create things and people like creating and sharing things, you could also search for basically anything. I mean, today, going on YouTube, um, you, can, you can learn how to program on YouTube if you look for the right videos. You, and not only, on not only YouTube, uh, not only programming, really, you can learn a lot of professions um, by going to YouTube and looking at people who just want to teach. Um, and that, again, the revolution here is that no longer are universities the gatekeepers of knowledge. Um, where we live in Sweden, maybe it's not such a such a dramatic change because we don't pay to go to get an education. But imagine in a country where you had to have a lot of money to get the skills for an occupation. Um, all of a sudden, it, the education wasn't only available for rich people; it was available for everybody. So, of course the piece of paper that um, verifies that you know this still matters. That's not what I'm saying. But the idea that um, in other places where knowledge is um, something you pay for, um, this changed with YouTube. Or it, if you look at how YouTube looks today, it's changed drastically. Um, and this democratizes knowledge, really, and spreads knowledge and makes allows people to raise their, their, their level of um, general knowledge across the entire population. So alongside the internet uh, and that revolution, I've said that way too many times this video, I'm sorry. Uh, alongside that came uh, mobile phones. Now the first mobile phones were 
uh, not very useful or they were useful but they were big uh, they were uh, used by business people and and Wall Street people and they weren't very accessible to a lot of everyday people so eventually um, phones got screens that had color on them I remember I was very happy because I was one of the first people that got a was it Nokia Nokia 3310i and it was in color and I was very excited about that but until then they weren't in color and the earlier ones all you could do is make phone calls and they started incorporating more and more things into it so my Nokia had snake on it <laughs> um, but you could also uh, send text messages and the more they started developing and seeing that people use these phones the more uh, functionality they added to it um, and they noticed that uh, it was useful people wanted it and it was possible to go online using your phone so they started building out networks that allowed your phone to uh, go out on the world wide web so in the 2000s i think they started building uh, 3g which was a faster and um, much more stable and reliable network for mobile phones for the for um, going online and with this of course kind of how it works right you have one piece of technology being developed another one that makes this piece of technology easier and then this develops and changes and they kind of influence each other so then mobile phones started changing and this they became smarter and smarter and more like a computer and then uh, um, Apple released the iPhone and everything changed. So phones before the iPhone, they did have the, the maybe mini games, the text messaging, the, the calling functionality, of course, I would hope. Um, but with the iPhone, it, it even added more into that. Um, so I remember having an MP3 player and a phone separately and with the iphone they added every every single device that you might think that you would need um, a video player or and a, a music player and uh, browsers like all of these different functionality into one single device one single computer that you could just have in your uh, in your pocket you pick up your phone it's not a phone anymore it's it's a computer and this sort of having it with you and being able to use it on a day-to-day -day basis and having this one single device that is your go-to for everything, it really changed the world. It's hard, again, to explain what a big difference uh, it made to um, how we live and how we function and how our institutions even function, if you look at today. So one big thing, even though it might not seem that revolutionary, was that it was a touch-based interface. So you had the screen and you actually pressed on the screen. Older phones had um, keyboards, so you would type, um, I'm sure you've seen this, but if you haven't, I'll just explain it briefly. If you were texting and you would type a certain letter, you would have to press a number a certain number of times to get to that letter. And that's how you texted. You didn't have like a physical keyboard unless you had a, a Blackberry, but yeah. Um, and they removed all of those hardware components and put it on the screen so that you could touch it and it would respond. Now, imagine that you have like a little keyboard that is stuck to the phone and you press it to to do something if you move that to your screen then you don't necessarily need to have it have a keyboard you could fake right because that is a fake keyboard you could fake a nintendo uh, nintendo game co um, controller have the same buttons and have them do the same thing so again the phone became more general purpose and it became programmable it became changeable depending on what you wanted the phone to do or what you want or, or what the user wanted the phone to do and going along with this apple released a bunch of applications or apps that uh, you could download yourself so every user didn't have the same thing on their phone you could customize your own phone to your needs uh, this wasn't possible before the most you could customize was maybe a, a ringtone 
Um, but now you could customize your entire functionality based on what you want to do with your phone. So then following this in 2008, uh, Android uh, started, um, they looked at what the iPhone was doing and what Apple had done and started um, competing with that and doing their own version of that. So Android is different to Apple in the sense that um, you have these apps that you can download, but they're not speci specifically made for only iPhones. They're made for any phone that can use the uh, Android software or the Android system. They can, they can use the, uh, and the, the app store that you have for Android, like Google Play today. Um, and by not having it connected so hard, uh, so um, so such a, a harsh connection between the hardware and the software, um, not only was this um, opening up the market a lot, um, but you could have uh, phones that were cheaper again, more available to more people, and sort of decentralized and democratized so that ev anyone could really let's say most people could have a phone um, even if it was the cheapest one they could have access to um, to that functionality they might not be able to take down all the applications but they still had they still had a way to to use that tool in their life uh, and much like the PC having more people using a technology makes them interested makes them maybe go and develop and opens up the market even more and that's what happened when uh, um, Android launched. So with this ease of use for mobile phones and with everybody having one, um, corporations started using them to uh, simplify their their day-to-day -day business. Um, instead of calling and keeping physical um, record, records or something, you could uh, have a database and you could ask users themselves to uh, store information. Um, they could streamline their work so that it uh, was easier and they could um, um, use give services that were simpler, faster and easier for the consumer as well. And when businesses do it, usually um, institutions like banking or hospitals or, or, or things like that, state institutions sort of tend to follow after because if it's easier and saves time and money for the corporations it is also going to save time and money for the state right so with that i really want to put some pressure off of us as human beings because we got a lot we get a lot of flack for being too chronically online or uh, that we use our phones too much but that is completely normal given what the phone is to us right now so beforehand, you would have a bus pass, a physical card bus pass that you would uh, put money on and uh, bleep whenever you wanted to go on a bus. And they don't have those anymore. You do that via your phone. Or parking, you would have um, uh, somewhere where you would go way back in the day, you would put coins in. Uh, but nowadays you, you uh, might maybe swipe your card, but again, we don't even have those anymore. We use our phone to uh, connect to an app that we type in our car um, license plate and that's how we park. So our phone is replacing so many different individual uh, tools that we used to need to navigate our society and our lives. And then it's not really that strange that we use it a lot and that we i wouldn't say, want to say hooked or are um, uh, addicted to it but that it's such a huge integral part of our lives um before if you wanted to get to know something you would have to buy an encyclopedia and look something up and that encyclopedia had to happen to have the thing you wanted to know and now if i'm curious about something i just google that um so yeah, there's a lot of stuff that might be very bad for us and there is an addictive nature to wanting something and getting it instantaneously. But think about how integral institutions and corporations and um, 
everything in society, how dependent, how much they use uh, the phone as a way to provide services. And then people wonder why we are so attached to our phone, because it is an essential tool to navigate our world today, really. So um, if you lose your phone, you, you're very crippled. Um, I don't know, I can't remember how I paid bills without being online. Um, do you remember how to, how would you pay a bill if you lost your phone? How would you pick up a package if you lost your phone today? Um, how would you go to the hospital? Because the way I do it is that I go in um, to the hospital and there's a QR code. I scan it, it sends me online and I verify with my bank ID. And my bank ID, well, that's connected to my phone. If I have another phone, I need to transfer my bank ID. So the phone is really this essential piece uh, of technology, this tool that has replaced so many other tools that our society used to use. Um, so it's no wonder that not only do we need it for navigating life, but it's since it's such a big part of our lives, people developed social media uh, as a way for us to stay connected and talk to each other. So with social media, that changed a lot of stuff too, because uh, much like YouTube, um, you could broadca broadcast anything to anyone and we were connected. We would log into an app because we wanted to see what other people did. And with video, it might be difficult because you need to have a camera, um, you need to have an idea, you need to do something. But it's a lot easier to write a sentence and broadcast that than it is to make a video and broadcast that. So social media really connected us and through this connection, um, changes in society uh, started happening. For example, um, since we could like uh, or dislike, thumbs down something, um, popularity uh, or certain people or certain themes became popular and you got influencers, people who are famous online for something um, that rivaled celebrities like uh, actors, musicians, um, people who used to get published using uh, traditional media like TV, uh, music, things like that and for different things. So, for example, you could be an influencer or you could be a social media presence in playing games because you are entertaining at playing games. Or you could be a political commentator that people fly, that people like listening to. And if an actor, musician, they create a work and these other people, they're maybe famous for articulating ideas uh, very well. So not only did it change my cat's being a rascal. There we go, she's calm now. So not only did it change um, how we connect to each other, it changed the subject matter, it changed who, um, not who gets to be seen, but it changed uh, due to people being popular and topics being popular or or certain things being popular it changed uh, fo it shifted focus from creating a piece of art or or a movie or or a um uh, an album a song to our everyday lives so if you would go to uh, twitch which is a streaming service for playing games, you would see somebody sitting in their living room playing a game, but they're being funny and when, they're, when they're doing it and talking about it. So it's this shift from art and something that somebody manufactured that isn't reality to being entertained by reality. Um, and it also changed who we connect with because we used to connect with maybe loved ones in another country or people that we needed to connect with for work and now we can very easily connect through interests. So you go on social media, so you go on TikTok, um, and you find people, you look for your interest, and you find people that have the same interest as you. It's not um, limited to people you know, or people that um, 
you might connect with uh, because you met them in real life. You connect with people through your shared interest uh, online and that's your entire relationship with them. You don't know them other um, outside of that relationship. So it's changed a lot of personal relationships, a lot of what we focus on as a society. Um, but it's also enabled us to share perspectives of the world with each other. So if you think about something like grassroots journalism, um, you would have these reporters beforehand that would get paid to go into the field and report what they saw. And they might not um, show up on time or they could be, uh, I don't want to say biased, but they could have their own angle. They could maybe not have the insider understanding. Um, and then you put a phone in everybody's hand and somebody who is on the street as a political movement is happening could uh, showcase that and show what it's like to be on the ground and see that and experience that or horrific example but um, what it might be like uh, during a terrorist attack um, it, I don't think it would be very easy to make sure that a journalist would authentically uh, just experience that and be able to um, share that with the world how horrible and how horrific that is um, but by putting phones in people's hands, we get to share things with each other that we couldn't before. Um, with mental health nowadays, it's grown a lot. Um, and people share how they feel and um, share problems that they, they might have online. And people see that and they think, oh, well, that's a problem I have as well. And they beforehand might not have that connection. And now that they see the everyday lives of people like them, they can understand things about themselves and about the world that they wouldn't before. So if you think about how propaganda works, for example, where one institution, one political um, party or uh, yeah, political party might control the media by having a way to broadcast the truth, so to speak, uh, to everybody, you take that control away from them and you um, you can share perspectives with the world and get perspectives uh, um, from places where you might not before. So it's more difficult in some senses, of course, um, to obscure what happens. Um, of course, uh, governments can still block sites or or make sure that people don't see things that they don't want, don't want to see. But having this technology, having this way of communicating uh, ha gives us a tool that might make it simpler to say, well, no, actually, this is what life is like uh, here, not what they say. Um, and that's very powerful um, and has given us ways to share our everyday lives in a way that wasn't possible before. So here's the really cool part, right? This is kind of why I like this to talk about this, uh, this topic. Um, so why is computer science important? So if you think about how technology has changed the world so much, um, as a coder, you have a huge influence on people's lives. Like, think about that everything I've mentioned so far is possible by code and by hardware. Um, by somebody writing stuff on a screen. Um, and then we have these radical changes to our society, to how we live, to how we interact, to, to everything really. To how our entire civilization really works. Um, that's pretty, pretty cool. And then you think about the fact that, you know, every single line of code, especially before AI, was written by a, by a, by a person, by a dude somewhere, or dudette. Um, that, that everything that's been made possible by that was because somebody sat down a, at a computer and wrote some lines. I think that's amazing. And then going into the profession, I feel like 
I have a say in what the future is going to look like. Now, it might not be Elon, Elon Musk level. It might not be that um, you uh, create that one piece of technology that changes everything. That's not what I'm saying. But by coding and at least knowing how code works, you have more of a voice in how the future will be shaped. Um, and that's, that's why it's important. That's why computer science is important because it does change so much. And I think it's really neat that um, we as developers have uh, a voice, a vote uh, in what that world, that future is going to look like. And looking at the numbers about how, of how many people actually know how to code, it's so few. It's um, according to uh, what I've come up with, less than 1% of the world that knows, that understands the language and knows how to speak the language that shapes the entire world. It's just amazing to think that so few people are the ones that develop the stuff that's going to shape and um, shape the future and be the baseline for how we interact and how we live. And it's pretty cool to think that um, you, you're going to be one of them. And so this leads us very swiftly into why I wanted to talk about ethics. Because if we're the ones deciding what the world will, will look like, we have some responsibility to make sure that it's a good world. Um, and when we go into coding uh, and developing software for people, we need to think about making it a world that's great for everyone, not just some people. So here I want to uh, make a case for diversity because um, making uh, software, I mean, it is coding, but you also need to have the context of what you're making the software for. So for example, I think it would be pretty difficult for me to like maybe make an app that will have something to do with getting having more testosterone for building muscle because I don't have a lot of testosterone. Um, and I think that as much as they might try and wanna wanna be good guys, a group of twenty dudes are gonna have a harder time writing an application for for. Um, women and and tracking their periods not because they're bad people not because they're not smart but because they don't have that contextual uh, knowledge that con con contextual basis and you can think about this in anything really um, you can think about this in the sense of it's going to be more difficult to write ai for um, finding skin cancer for darker skin if you have no idea what skin cancer or dar on darker skin looks like. You need that contextual knowledge um, and apply this to you know anything, a, a medical condition. Um, without that contextual knowledge, if there's only this one um, streamlined uh, homogenous group of people doing code for everyone, then they're, they're not gonna, they're gonna miss stuff. And again, not because they're bad people, not because they want to, they're not smart enough, all of those things. It's because these, this contextual knowledge, this, oh, I've experienced that, so here's how that works, that is fundamental in creating software that people can use. So diversity, uh, while might seem like this fluffy, um, not necessary or, or superfluous uh, um, principle that we want to introduce into our workforce, it, it, it is going to, uh, it might slow down the work because when you have people that have different ideas and experiences, you might have more conflicts and, and um, diverging opinions, sure. But if you have a group of people who all agree and never have any conflicts, but then have no contextual knowledge and create an app that nobody uses, that time is wasted anyway, because it's not going to have that fundamental uh, insider information about the things that are important to that specific thing. Um, so diversity is pretty important in that sense, to use that life experience that people have. And when you code, you need to take a lot of different things into account. So earlier we, we um, spoke about traffic lights. Uh, if the light is green, you cross the street. Um, but this is a 
extreme oversimplification. What if there's um, a, a, a race? What if it's in the middle of the night? What if you're blind? What if um, the road is extremely slippery and somebody's driving very fast? There are so many different factors to take into account that just if the light is green or not, it's not enough to make a, an, an intelligent uh, de decision, really. So when you code, you need to think about these things. Um, I saw a TV program where they talked about uh, having a pacemaker that would shock the system when you had um, either a high pulse or, or uh, a low pulse. I can't remember exactly. Um, but it was a range that they were like, if, if the pulse is he, uh, not between the, these, this um, range, you need to give a shock. And they didn't take into account that uh, pregnant women, they go outside of that range a lot. And then a perfectly healthy human being or a perfectly healthy range for that pregnant woman, she could get a shock that could really damage her and really hurt her. Um, so you need to take those things into account and they're just easier to do when you have uh, that diversity, those experiences on a team. Um, and that is kind of the ethical responsibility of us as programmers to try as hard as we can to think about as many circ circumstances as we can uh, to include as many people and variable for the specific problem as we can. Um, this is extremely difficult because we're never really going to be able to think about every single scenario. Um, I took a vaccine shot today with the, for the ticks and um, I'm young, but I have a uh, autoimmune disease, so I need to have an extra dose. And the computer screen popped up and said, nope, this person isn't supposed to have this dose now, they're too young. So they didn't take into account that I need an extra dose. And that's just like one tiny way that it happened today to me. Um, so by not taking these things into account, you miss a lot of stuff you miss a lot of people, a lot of situations and, and circumstances. So we need to think about uh, as developers, how do we bring everyone along to make this new world that um, is as good as it can be for everybody or for as many people as we can. So going from ethics into the next and last segment, AI, pretty easy leap there. So AI is artificial intelligence. Um, it's developed very fast in the past few years and um, there's been a couple of uh, controversies and a couple of really great use cases. But if we start with something called big data, which um, is a very, useful, um, a very useful tool that we use today, but that can really come with a lot of problems if we don't think it through properly. So essentially what big data is, is um, using artificial intelligence, AI, and algorithms to take a huge, uh, huge amount of, of data and try to find any and all patterns within that data. Um, and people use this to understand situations, make better decisions, to see the causality of things, um, and to develop better practices. Um, let's uh, think of, for example, if we notice that, uh, if we take stock of the entire world when we get sick throughout the year, um, finding a um, pattern to when that is could help a lot of people not being sick. So you have this huge, uh, big set of big population, and we try to find these um, trends and patterns in there to uh, maybe shape policy or people want to know um, why do we sell so, many, so much chocolate in, before Valentine's Day and they find a, find a pattern there to sell more chocolate etc etc or maybe even why do these people over here get more diabetes than these people over here even, they, even though they eat just as much sugar um, by looking at uh, big populations and uh, these patterns and all these different variables, AI really gives us insight into why things are the way they are so we can make better decisions. 
but uh, there is a little bit of a problem with this because um, big data or data, this is kind of what um, a data scientist sort of works with. Um, this is dependent on f um, cataloging and um, gaining the information correctly. So say for example that um, and this is a very not really applicable example but just so to get an idea say that i wanted to ask ai to define what a party is so i would ask ai to uh, look at um, 50 images of a party and on those 50 images all we have are say asian men and um white women just taken out of nowhere. So then the AI would conclude that a party, that um, um, black people are not invited to a party because it analyzed what we said, hey, this is what a party is. We gave it the examples and it concluded that there are no black people here. So clearly black people <laughs> aren't invited to parties. Um, and you can see how that is crazy, right? Um, so not only are we here feeding the uh, AI with a uh, limited uh, source of that or limited data. We're not really giving the full scope of what a party is. Uh, but, but we're also um, not defining things properly. We are um, saying that here's, here's a party, we're labeling this as a party, but we're not thinking about um, see if I can come up with a better example. I have a better example. So say that we are going to make a catalog of uh, children's parties instead. So um, then we are going to uh, have a catalog of appropriate presents for a child. So then we'll add knife, gun, um, think of any dangerous weapon you can add that to that list, right? So, uh, and then we say that at this party, what they're gonna do is we're gonna give this to all the children and they're gonna do what they're going to do. So here you see that we're labeling the party wrong. We're saying that the party is supposed to be something uh, that that we don't want. Um, we're saying appropriate toy. That is a wrong label for the content of that label. A knife is not an appropriate toy for a child, of course. Um, and we're so we're not just feeding it the wrong information but we're labeling the stuff that we put into that uh, incorrectly as well and when we do this without knowing it can get really dangerous so for example um we can uh, this has happened a lot in in law enforcement so say that we have certain neighborhoods that have um racial racial representation of um some some races commit more crimes, maybe men, women, different types of crimes. Um, and then we don't look at the context. We uh, maybe don't look at how vulnerable that, uh, that area uh, is. We might not look at um, other circumstances. We might not look at the fact that um, maybe all of the people in that area um, were protesting and that's why they were arrested, but they're just labeled as criminals, right? But then that's in a register somewhere. And then when we use AI, we might have um, that biased with us. Um, so we'll look for people who fit what the data told us is a criminal. And we might uh, mislabel people as criminals without even meaning to because the, the data told us this. Uh, so without looking at context and without understanding what we're feeding um, AI and what we might be missing when we feed the AI, we can really um, make wrong conclusions and, and really judge populations and minorities uh, and groups of people um, incorrectly based on those. And that in turn might uh, ex uh, exacerbate the problem. That, may, that, that might make it so that those people, how do I explain this? If we never, for example, if we say that, you know, um, women don't go into tech, for example, then that's going to be our reality and that's what AI is going to tell us. But then when we hire people 
we'll hire people based on the, the numbers today. Well, we know that 10% uh, of tech workers are women, so we are only going to hire 10% or something like that. But if more women want to go into the workforce, then there's a gate uh, that we've decided to implement because of how we view reality. So then we won't hire more women, then it will stay in 10%, and then the, the cycle sort of um, perpetuates itself. Um, so we really have to be careful to examine what we put in, how we label what we put in, um, and the results as well. Like, okay, this is the result. Why is this a result? Is this a reflection of our reality um, just straight up as it is? Or do we have to think, uh, um, think about this and understand why it looks this way? So going from AI being wrong into ChatGPT. So uh, let's talk a little bit about ChatGPT and what it is and how it works. So ChatGPT is something called an LLM or a large language model. So what the creators of ChatGPT and other similar um, large language models have done is that they've taken a gin ginormous amount of text information um, I believe that they scanned the internet, don't quote me on that, but they scanned a lot of information. And then they analyzed which words most often follow each other. So ChatGPT isn't smart or intelligent at all. Um, it just has um, analyzed which words usually follow each other. So it's really based on the information that it got fed so if we go back to the conception of this and say that enough people online wrote that the sky is green, then ChatGPT would see that the sky is green is a sequence of words that often come together. So if you ask that language model, what color is the sky, it would say with confidence, well, the sky is of course green. And that is how large language models really work. Um, so it's scanned all of these things and it works on word probability, really. Um, and considering the fact that, for example, Wikipedia gets um, edited and moderated by the community, uh, errors get fixed very fast um, just, just by the um, notion of having a lot of people fact check things, usually uh, makes it very um, reliable information. However, it's not foolproof. It isn't smart and it doesn't have all the context and all of the, all of the knowledge on how to apply that context. It only is based off of probability. So a lot of it is correct, but if you, for example, Google, um, uh, use ChatGPT to, to um, figure out code or write code or, or figure out algorithms. Um, if you don't have the, the base knowledge of seeing what it gives you back and seeing uh, that, wait a minute, that's, that's not correct. That's, that's not how things work. Then you can just take what it says and just accept it as truth, even when it isn't. You would just, if you've never seen the sky and the chat GPT told you that the sky is green, you would believe it if you don't know that it's based on probability. So it's really important when you use it to um, analyze the answers and see if this is feasible and, and fact check it because, because of this, because it's not foolproof and because it just works off of uh, prob probability and word sequencing. So there are these huge, huge debates today on whether or not we should allow ChatGPT and similar technology in academic work. And the, the thing is that people who are in the workforce and work as programmers, they use ChatGPT all the time. And if we, when we learn how to code, don't use it, we won't have that experience and we'll be behind. We won't have that practical application. We won't have that experience of how to make our work effective and streamlined using that tool. And we won't have that edge that everybody who does use it has. Um, using ChatGPT to learn how to code isn't a problem. The problem is if you use it without understanding 
the output, what it gives you back, and using it uh, without checking it, using it without understanding how to apply it, um, so to speak, for cheating. So, for example, say if we, we use another example that isn't ha that doesn't have to do with code. Say you were writing an essay and you needed ideas for an angle. You might ask ChatGPT for ten suggestions for an angle for a specific topic. That isn't really cheating because you're doing the same thing you would do if you Googled it and looked up what people other people would say, and then you would take that information and adapt it and make it your own. And that's really how you should be using ChatGPT. If you have a problem that you need to solve in programming, for example, by all means, ask it uh, to give you suggestions and ask it to explain the suggestions and ask, ask it, uh, what does this code mean? What does it do? Uh, how does it work? Do you have any other suggestions on how to fix this problem? But just typing in, this is my problem, and then copy pasting, it's going to make you a worse programmer and it's not going to give you that background knowledge you need to fact check the answers you, you get. Now, when you encounter problems in code or when you see algorithms you haven't seen before, ChatGPT can be like a teacher that doesn't need to sleep or eat and is always avail available to you. Um, ask it to explain things and uh, showcase things and compare things and use it as a teacher. Um, the one problem is if you use it just to quote unquote copy your homework, right? So it's going to be incorporated more and more into our lives and by learning it now and how to use it properly and using it to make you a better programmer instead of a programmer that just copy pastes, it's only going to give you uh, an advantage in the future. So use it, but uh, don't abuse it. So that was a very long video, but that was the first video of the course where we've gone through the origin of the computer, what computer science is, um, how uh, it's evolved, evolved throughout time, uh, how it impacted our society, and because of its huge impact, what responsibilities we have as developers, and the future, the dangers that we need to think about, the responsibilities we have, and how to approach these technologies that are emerging, that are uh, tools at our fingertips. Um, and I hope you learned, what I hope you take with you from this video is um, remembering the weave and how binary is yes or no, hole or no hole, fabric or no, f or thread or no thread. I hope you take with you the notion that if you exchange um, in programming um, these punched holes in a card, if you don't just use it for numbers, but you can use it for for anything that you just slot in there, like a color or, or a music note, you can use code to create anything. And I hope you take with uh, you how much computers and um, technology has integrated into our lives, changed it, and how that means that we as developers have a responsibility to make sure that everyone gets on board and everyone is included in the future, but also all the possibilities and all the things we could do with it and how we could improve people's lives. Um, and how awesome it is that you're gonna be one of those people that has a vote in what the future is going to look like. So thanks a lot for listening and uh, hopefully I'll see you in the next video.